This is the region theme lecture for the Pacific Rim, the last region module. And the theme for this particular region is natural hazards, which is going to sort of bring us back to North America a bit because this is a theme that's really important to Alaskans in particular. And so it's one of the reasons why I like to end on this particular theme. We also sort of come back to that original question that we had at the beginning of course to, as to how does geography impact humans. And we've always looked at how the land impacts humans in terms of development and food and water and things like this. But now we're sort of seeing what are the dangerous impacts of the land. Yet it links to a lot of stuff that we've already talked about in the course such as resources, population and growth, as well as globalization too, as you'll see in a bit. So natural hazards are any disaster event that impacts humans and can cause um, loss of life and of property as well. And there are lots of different types of hazards and we could expand this list if we needed to as well, but these are sort of the basic recognized hazards. The geophysical hazards will be earthquakes and tsunamis, volcanoes and mass movements, which would be landslides, and avalanches would be included in that too. We'll be focusing a bit on earthquakes and tsunamis in this particular lecture. The meteorological or climatological hazards include um, tropical cyclones and extratropical cyclones. These would be things in North America like hurricanes and also big powerful storms like the winter storms we get in Alaska. Tornadoes fall in here as well as drought and desertification and just general flooding too. Um, we'll be focusing a bit on tropical cyclones. Biological hazards include epidemics, infestations of insects and things like that. We'll talk about pandemics as the biological hazard. And then the final hazard here I'm not going to talk about. These are extraterrestrial hazards such as space weather or impact events, things like that. Um, I will be talking about one other hazard at the very end of this lecture, and that is global climate change, which is a human-induced natural hazard. Now let's put natural hazards a little bit in the context of this course and also in context generally as well. Some things that are worth knowing is that the number of disasters or hazard incidents are actually increasing over time. If we take a look at the last 30 years or so, there's been a constant rise in the trend of reported disasters, according to the Center for Research on the Epidemiology of Disasters. Um, the good news is that the cost in human lives does not seem to be increasing a great deal. About 173 million people are impacted by disasters every single year. Um, that comes uh, to about 76,000 deaths per year. The 173 million is just people who are actually impacted by it. One of the reasons why disasters and hazards are increasing over time is probably in part because population has been increasing, as we've talked about, and this brings more people into harm's way. There's also greater population density as well, which increases people's vulnerability to natural disasters, particularly in slum areas. So slum growth and also things like deforestation, which we've talked about, that increases flooding and the problems of rain. Um, these things tend to increase the number of disasters and the impact of those disasters as well. Now with relation to development, which we've been talking about all throughout this course, the lack of economic development tends to impact vulnerability um, because what happens when a country is unprepared for a natural hazard is that there are larger numbers of people who are killed. But interestingly enough, the total amount of damage that takes place tends to be highest in countries with very high levels of development because of course those countries have a lot more infrastructure and they have a lot more things that ultimately can be impacted. So I'm just going to go through a couple of key hazards here. The first thing I'm going to talk about is earthquakes and tsunamis. And I've already spent a little bit of time talking about tectonic activity way back in an earlier region exploration. Um, you'll probably remember as well from your basic earth science classes that earth, earthquakes and tsunamis are caused by plate tectonics and the forces 
that are brought upon the surface of the Earth as the large portions of the outer crust of the planet uh, grind up against one another as plates. Um, these plates come into contact with each other. Sometimes one plunges underneath another one. That's called subduction. Other places, they just sort of collide into one another in collision. And translation occurs when plates are grinding next to each other. And what happens in the creation of an earthquake is that all of the tectonic pressure um, that is caused by these plates moving against one another is built up. But that pressure isn't released all at one time. In fact, what happens is plates and then the faults that are related to those plates actually store up a lot of the strain that is taking place as a result of the movement of the plates themselves. Eventually, that strain overcomes whatever geophysical forces are causing the fault not to move. And when that happens, all that pent-up energy is released. And that release of energy leads to earthquakes. If it happens underneath the ocean, it will cause an earthquake as well as displacing the ocean floor, which can cause a tsunami. One thing that's really important to note about plate tectonics and the release of energy is that in areas that are really susceptible to earthquakes, the release of large amounts of energy seems to be inevitable. So in a place like Alaska, even though we not, might not feel a lot of quakes, there's a lot of plate tectonic activity occurring that is eventually going to be released, causing large earthquakes that will impact us. When that happens, though, we don't know could be the next year or it could be in the next hundred years. What we do know is that the geography of earthquakes and the tsunamis they produce is very strongly related to where plate boundaries are, particularly subduction. Um, you can see here, looking at this map of global earthquakes between 1900 and 2013, and of course this is just really showing big earthquakes, um, large numbers of them take place along that um, rim of fire that we talked about before. Um, you can also see that there are a lot of quakes that occur in portions of Asia where you have collision and translation taking place as well. So these are the most hazard prone areas in the world for large global earthquakes. Now of course the impacts that earthquakes have include shaking that can lead to building damage as well as infrastructure damage as well subsidence of areas that can sometimes take areas that were once above sea level and push them below sea level, or the liquefaction of soils, which essentially turns soils into a liquid-like material that can then flow away. Um, it can bury people, it can bury buildings, it can cause a great deal of destruction. And then, of course, tsunamis are also generated by earthquakes, and they are really some of the deadliest parts of earthquakes, particularly when they happen in areas that otherwise might not see a lot of loss of life because preparation for the earthquake is quite good. Now, in context, earthquakes and tsunamis are the deadliest of the natural hazards. In fact, if we look back at that um, Center for Research on Epidemiological Epidemiology of Disasters, um, we can actually see that the greatest number of deaths in the last decade have been caused by earthquakes and tsunamis by really a large number. Um, about 42,000 people have been killed by earthquakes and tsunamis in the last decade, and that far outweighs anything else. Now, it turns out that not as many people are impacted by them, because things like floods and storms and droughts are much more extensive in nature. In the case of the developed world, um, these are some of the most expensive events, as I've talked about before. In the developing world, they tend to be the deadliest events, again, because of a lack of preparation. Tropical cyclones are another very important natural hazard that are found in the Pacific Rim and other parts of the world as well. We know tropical cyclones in North America as hurricanes, but they go by different names, particularly typhoons in the Pacific. What they are are areas of low atmospheric pressure caused because you have a lot of heat in tropical waters that causes the air to lift upwards. Remember, warm air rises. And those low pressure areas produce storms. They lead to large amounts of precipitation and winds as well.
And what happens in the formation of a tropical cyclone is that the rising air of a tropical area begins to release a lot of energy as clouds form and precipitation forms. And then eventually all this released energy, which is creating clouds, which is creating precipitation, which is creating winds, begins to be organized by the fact that the Earth is rotating on its axis. Um, the ax axis. Um, this releases the Coriolis force, um, which in turn helps to organize a storm and give it that big swirling look that you have seen before. Energy keeps being released, it keeps deepening, and eventually you get stronger and stronger storms. The more air you have flowing into a storm, which is what winds do, the more moisture you have and the stronger the storm becomes and the winds become stronger and stronger over time. Now these storms tend to be found where we would expect them to be found in and near warm tropical oceans. So this is a map that shows the tracks and intensities of all tropical storms for uh, I believe it's a several decade period um, as mapped by NOAA. Um, and NASA. You can see looking at the map here that you have different tracks that are different colors. The redder the color, the more intense the storm is. The red are, are um, intensity scale five storms, um, which we're all pretty familiar with this idea of a class 5 storm. And one thing that's really interesting to note about this map is that the greatest intensity of these very powerful storms is actually found in the western part of the Pacific, near our region in the Pacific Rim, as was talked about in the region exploration. Now the impacts of these storms of course include wind and the damage that comes from that, but more importantly is storm surge high tides that are much higher than they normally would be that essentially flush out coastal areas causing huge amounts of damage. Of course you have flooding due to rain as well as was experienced so um, horribly in the Houston area um, in 2017 and you also have tornadoes produced by these as well. Now in context, storms and other forms of flooding impact more people than any other hazard. They also tend to be fairly costly as well to the global economy when taken as a whole. They're not as costly in terms of lives lost, again that's earthquakes and tsunamis, but they do the most damage, especially long-term damage that impacts the development of countries because it's so hard to overcome the problems caused by flooding. Now the third natural hazard I want to briefly talk about are pandemics. This is a biological hazard. A pandemic is any infectious disease that impacts a large number of people and then spreads across a large geographical area as well. And there are lots of examples of them through history and recently as well. Things like the plague, HIV AIDS, influenza, which a lot of people are quite worried about right now, and then things like viral hemorrhagic fe fevers, which would include Ebola, which was in the news not too long ago. The study of these diseases is called epidemiology and how they move through and across particular geographic areas. Geographers have contributed to the study of epidemiology by helping to understand how exactly those diseases move through various forms of what are called diffusion. The first one is called relocation diffusion, and here's an interesting map that shows how different diseases, um, including things like leprosy and malaria, began in one part of the world and then moved to another part, uh, largely because humans were moving, and as they moved they brought those diseases with them to different parts of the world. But what we're most familiar with in disease movement is something that's called contagious diffusion. And this is a map that shows the plague during the Middle Ages. And you can see the different coloring. The darker the color, the earlier the beginning of the plague. And you can see that the plague sort of spread across and through Europe over time as people transmitted it one to another, village to village to village. In the modern world, though, diffusion of diseases is quite different than this. Um, this is actually a YouTube video, 
and I'm going to play it right now, and you're going to see a disease, a hypothetical disease, get started on the island of Cyprus in the Mediterranean. And then watch how it spreads, neither through contagion nor through relocation. There it begins. Now it spreads locally a little bit, but suddenly it appears in northern Europe. It's crossing Europe, jumps across to North America, and it does this almost sort of random pattern that can be a little bit difficult to understand. The pattern that we're actually seeing right here is actually a pattern that is most um, This is a pattern that is known as hierarchical diffusion, and it takes place not in the typical ways that we understand um, contagion to take place, but instead jumps across large areas. And it does that, especially in the modern age, because diseases aren't spread from village to village. They're spread by people flying on airplanes. And this is a map right here that shows airplane routes across the world. If a disease gets started in Cyprus, or if it gets started in Atlanta, or if it gets started in Siberia someplace, first it's going to jump um, to the major populated area that is tied to it. And then from that, it's going to jump through a hierarchy of um, connections, and in this case, connections that would come about as a result of flight paths. Now, in context, um, one of the things that this really shows us and tells us is that disease has become really impacted by globalization. And in some ways now, developed countries are more at risk as a result of pandemics because people are so much better connected. If you go back and look at that flight map before, you'll see that developing countries that historically have been more at risk because they're not prepared for public health risks are now somewhat isolated because they're often out of this large international flight context. The impacts of pandemics, of course, include the human costs, but also huge economic costs as well. For example, the Ebola outbreak that took place between 2014 and 15, which was relatively limited geographically to three countries, Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, led to the loss of something like $2.2 billion worth of GDP, according to the World Bank. The final hazard I want to talk about is global climate change. Global climate change is, of course, a human-produced natural hazard. It's caused by what's referred to as atmospheric heating by radiative forcing. And I'm not going to get into this too much here, um, but I do want to give you a basic understanding of global climate change if you haven't thought much about it before. Um, it's caused because the sun's radiation coming into the atmosphere um, is actually not so much heating the atmosphere as it is heating the surface of the Earth. The surface of the Earth then emits infrared radiation, and this would include, by the way, land masses and water masses as well, and that is what's responsible for heating the atmosphere. And that's because the Earth's atmosphere has a bunch of what are called greenhouse gases in them that are really effective at absorbing that infrared radiation that comes from the planet, from the ocean, and from land masses, and helps the atmosphere to retain that energy. Clouds help to do this as well, I should note. And ultimately, the amount of solar radiation that goes into the atmosphere equals the amount of infrared that comes out. But the composition of the atmosphere really increases or decreases the efficiency of the atmosphere's ability to trap that infrared radiation for longer periods of time. And because those greenhouse gases increase that efficiency, it in turn means that the atmosphere will become warmer over time. This is a diagram shamelessly stolen from, I believe, a physical geography textbook that I've used um, that attempts to show the process of energy coming in versus the energy going out. And it's a little bit complicated because a lot of infrared radiation is actually sort of circulated in the atmosphere. Um, but if you add up all the numbers and sort of get a basic understanding of this, um, you should be able to see that what's really significant about the atmosphere is not so much that more or less energy is coming in or out. It really all has to do with the gases and their ability to retain energy. The key greenhouse gases that humans produce 
include, as most of you probably know, carbon dioxide, which is produced as a result of the combustion of fossil fuels. But we also produce extra amounts of methane and nitrous oxide and a class of chemical called hydrochlorofluorocarbons. All of these things are very good at absorbing infrared radiation and making the atmosphere more efficient. In addition, human, humans impact the atmosphere by doing things like cutting forests down um, and uh, um, increasing land for agriculture and also by um, producing aerosols that go into the atmosphere as well. These aerosols, though, have a cooling impact on the atmosphere rather than a heating impact. All told, um, climatologists, uh, people who study the atmosphere, um, argue very persuasively that humans are exerting a significant impact on temperature increases around the planet, much greater than those that would naturally occur as a result of fairly predictable Sun-Earth relations. Here's a diagram that I think many of you have probably seen before that shows concentrations of greenhouse gases over the last 2,000 years. And you can see this dramatic increase of carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide just in the last couple of decades through, since the advent of the Industrial Revolution. So what are some of the th impacts of this um, human-produced natural hazard? Well, again, I don't have a lot of time to go into all of this, and I just want to give you sort of a taste of this hazard. But among the physical impacts of climate change that are likely to take place in the next 100 years or so include a fairly significant increase in global temperatures, somewhere between 3 and 7 degrees Fahrenheit, which might not seem like a lot, but really will have a very big impact on things like ecosystems um, and the amount of water we find in the soil and things like that. Oceans are warming too and acidifying. Uh, glacial ice is being lost, as is sea ice as well. And because of this, sea levels are predicted to rise as much as seven, uh, as little as seven inches, but as much as 23 inches in the next 100 years, having already risen about seven inches in the last 100 years. In addition, there should be increased numbers of storms and storm surges as well. And precipitation is going to change as well. We will likely see greater amounts of severe precipitation in some places and greater amounts of drought, particularly in warmer tropical areas. Soils will be impacted as well. We've talked a little bit about soils in this course, not too much, but there are likely to be very big impacts in the soil. And ecosystems will begin to shift, species will be lost, and you've probably been reading a little bit about coral bleaching as well taking place in the oceans. The impacts on humans are going to be pretty extensive. And just again, a taste of some of the things that could um, impact humans would mean that sea level changes will impact coastal cities. There will be greater costs and a displacement of people from this. This is something that is explored a little bit in the uh, geographic explorations. Water supplies will continue to be challenged, as we've talked about in this course. Um, food insecurity may be impacted as well. And diseases like pandemics are going to be more likely to spread and impact more people, especially in the context of globalization. There will be a lot of economic costs associated with global climate change, um, and they are much um, they're very likely to outweigh any benefits that come with it. And in fact, the hazards could be fairly disastrous to humanity. Putting this in context just a little bit in, in the context of this course, um, the developing world is probably going to be impacted significantly greater than many parts of the developed world are. And that's somewhat ironic because, of course, the developing world played a pretty minor role in causing this problem and are now going to be disproportionately impacted by it. Many developing countries around the world have a lot of extra vulnerabilities that we've talked about as well, including things like pressure on water resources, um, issues of food security, and slums, many of which are born, built in very low-lying areas, which we've taken a look at before in this course. So these are just some of the key things to think about and consider when thinking about natural hazards and how they impact humans.